All right. How's everybody doing this evening? Great. How are you? Good. We're still waiting on a couple people to come on in here. So uh, what has been the best part of online school? No, 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 no. I didn't ask what was good. I asked what was the best part, meaning it doesn't necessarily have to be good. It just has to be better than the worst, right? Going home. Going home? Okay. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. What else? Yeah, what, what else? School's only for like three hours. Yeah, it's really strange, right? When you're on your own time, you can learn everything there is to learn in three hours versus the normal eight hours, right? Kind of makes you wonder why they keep you there all that time. Weird. Yeah, I, yeah. All right, then what's been the worst part of doing school online? Can't ask questions? Is what? Spanish class is terrible. I believe that. Don't know how to do math. I like math. I, I, I do the maths. I can do the maths. All right. So I think everybody's in here. So we're gonna go. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so what we're gonna be doing tonight is we're going to be uh, kind of looking at some things that are taking place in our culture and trying to, uh, trying to understand them rightly, trying to, to make sure that we uh, understand truthfully what is taking place before us. I think we can all agree that this has been one of the weirdest and the most chaotic years we've ever seen. I mean, it's certainly in the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my lifetime, and I'm sure the other adults in the room can, can agree with that. You know, there's definitely been some strange things that have happened in the past, but I've, I've not seen anything like this. And that's not just because of, you know, the virus, or because of the pandemic, if there even is a pandemic, right? You know, some people are calling it the plandemic, which we're not going to get into conspiracy theories right now. But it's not just because of that or because we have an election coming up or, or because of the uh, sort of racial tensions that are taking place in our culture. But there's just this, this, there just seems to be this overarching just chaos that's kind of infecting every area of our lives. It's infecting our work. It's infecting our relationships. It's infecting our churches. It's infecting our schools. It's infecting uh, everything. No, no, nothing is, is outside of, of this, this craziness that, that seems to be uh, uh, just injecting itself into every area of life. And the reality is, is that everyone has an answer to that problem. Everyone looks at what's taking place and everyone says, here's what's taking place and here's how we need to fix it. Uh, every news station has an answer to this problem. Every political candidate has an answer to this problem. Every podcast you listen to has an answer to this problem. Education has an answer to this problem. And the reality is, is that most of these answers that people are giving to the problem are all different, right? Somebody says that the way we fix this is by more education, right? We need people to learn more. If they can just learn more, then maybe, uh, maybe these bad things won't happen. And some people are saying, well, we need more police. If we had more police, then these bad things wouldn't happen. And some people are saying, well, we need no police, right? If we had no police, then these bad things wouldn't happen. And everybody has their own angle, and they're all approaching these things, and they all uh, seem to have an answer. And every answer contradicts the next one. And so it's difficult for us to look at what's happening in our culture, to look at what I've heard some people describe as the dumpster fire, that is 2020, and to honestly say, how do we, how do we address this? How do we fix it? First of all, to ask, what is going on, and then what do we do about it, right? And, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to lay out for you what the Scripture has to say, because I believe that the Scripture has the answer. The Bible has the answers. Um, just in passing, I want to mention a couple of passages before we get to our text. Um, uh, if you want to go ahead and write these down in your notes, uh, John 14, 5 and 6, John 17, verses 14 through 17, and then 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16 and 17. Uh, just sort of the, these uh, passages of Scripture really lay out exactly uh, what the Scripture is and why it's important that we view everything in this life through the lens of Scripture. Uh, first of all, in John 14, this is where Jesus uh, famously says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me, right? Uh, there's something we have to understand about the Bible, right? The Bible is about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament looks forward to Jesus. Everything in the Gospels is about Jesus, and everything in the Epistles, uh, the letters that come uh, uh, after the Gospels, is looking back to Jesus. Everything in the Scriptures centers on Jesus, right? 
And Jesus tells uh, his disciples, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? He is the only way to God, and he is the truth that leads us to God, and that he is the life that we receive uh, 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 through coming to God. Right? He is the truth. And then in John 17, um, Jesus is offering his high priestly prayer before uh, he's getting ready to be executed. And as he is uh, praying to the Father, he's praying for his disciples. And one of the things he says is he says to the Father, he says, sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. Right? He says your word is truth. And there's kind of a double meaning to this because Jesus refers to himself as the word, but he's also referring to the written word that's in the scriptures, right? And so Jesus refers to himself. He says, I am the truth. And then he points to his word and says, the word is the truth. And then lastly, in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul is instructing his young mentee, Timothy. And as uh, he's instructing him, he is uh, pointing him to the one source of truth. And what he tells Timothy is he says that all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. Now, when Paul said this, they didn't have a New Testament. This is important to understand. When Paul said this, all they had was the Old Testament scriptures, right? There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There was no revelation, right? These, 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 the, the canon had not been uh, recognized and not had been fully completed yet. And so when he is pointing him to the scriptures, he's pointing him to the written word that they had at that time, right? Which was only the Old Testament. And he says that the scriptures are the very breath of God, right? They actually breathe Life. It's important that we understand this, right? Jesus points to himself. He says, I am the truth. And he says, the word is truth. And Paul reiterates that and, and fleshes that out a little bit more in saying that the scriptures are actually breathed out by God. If we are to understand what is taking place in our culture today, we have to do it through the lens of scripture. All truth is God's truth. And truth is only truth insofar as it is consistent with God's truth. One of the ways I like to illustrate this is the analogy of a ruler, right? What do we use a ruler to do? Measure, Measure but what else? Straight. It's straight. We use it to draw straight lines, right? If I was to get up and draw a straight line, right, that line looks pretty straight, right? And then maybe Nora comes up here and draws another line, and we say, well, Nora's line is straighter than Drew's line. But how do we actually know whether or not a line is straight? You have to put it up against a ruler, and you have to measure it and see if it's straight or not. See, I may draw a straight line, and it may look straight until we put a ruler up to it and say, actually, Drew, that's pretty, it's pretty terrible. It's not straight at all. Right? That's what the scripture is. Right? When uh, Fox News tells us that this is what's going on in our culture, and this is the way that we have to address it, it, it might sound good. Right? When MSNBC tells us, hey, this is what's going on in our culture, and this is how we need to address it, what they say may sound good, but the way we test whether or not it's actually true is we have to measure it up against the scriptures to see if it's truly straight, right? We have to see if it's truly a straight line. Otherwise, it's just my opinion against your opinion, and maybe it looks straight to me, but that's because my head's crooked. You know, we never know. Until we measure it up against the ruler, until we measure these things up against the ruler that is God's word, we'll never be able to discern what is true from what is Clear, the scriptures make clear that the, the only true standard is the word of God. So how do we understand what is taking place in our culture, right? How, how are we to make sense of what we see before us? And to understand this, we're going to be taking a look at Romans 1. What we're going to do is I'm going to read it uh, for us. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to uh, the book of Romans. That's in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab one real quick. I'll give you a couple seconds to grab a Bible. And we're going to be reading uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And that's kind of the second half of uh, uh, chapter 1. And so just to give a, a little background, Romans is often referred to as the very first sort of systematic breakdown of the gospel, right? In this letter, what Paul is attempting to do is he's attempting to lay out from start to finish, exactly what the gospel is, exactly why Christ came, and what our need is for him, right? Of course, throughout the scriptures, we can see allusions to the gospel, we see references to it, but the book of Romans is really where he lays it out in a very uh, systematic format, 
starting at the beginning, going all the way through to uh, not only just what the gospel is, but then how, what are we supposed to do in response to it. And so in this chapter, what he's, what he's starting with is he's starting, uh, first of all, with uh, an anthropology. Does anybody know what anthropo- anthropology is? Yes. What is it? Study of humans, right. And anthropology is the study of man, right? We talk about theology, which is the study of God. And anthropology is the study of man. And what he's laying out is he's laying out a doctrine of man. He is trying to establish, first and foremost, in order to understand the gospel, we have to understand man, right? We have to understand what man's condition is. And that's what he's about to lay out for us in this first chapter of uh, Romans uh, 1. So... Uh, starting in verse 18, we're going to go ahead and read through, and then we're just going to go back uh, through uh, this chapter, and we're just going to go line by line, verse by verse, and try to make sense of what Paul is getting at here in, uh, in Romans. So starting in verse 18, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For it is in ri- the righteousness of Uh, God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I'm sorry, that's starting in verse 16. Those letters are real small. Now getting to verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because he has shown it to them. For his his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness evil, disobedience to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word. Lord, that your word is trustworthy, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word will by no means pass away. Lord, we thank you that we have something through which we can uh, analyze the things that are taking place before us. We thank you that we have a standard by which we can measure our lives. Lord, we thank you that we have a, a holy scripture that we can learn from, Lord, that we can be uh, reformed by, that we can submit ourselves to. God, I pray that as we look at the things taking place in our culture, Lord, that the scriptures would be the only ruler by which we would measure these things. Lord, And we would not be uh, trusting in the doctrines of men, Lord. We would not be uh, trusting in the uh, wisdom of this world, Lord. But we would look to your true and your holy word as the only source of uh, of truth. And we pray all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. So that was quite a big chunk of of scripture. And we're going to go back and we're just going to kind of walk through this and then make some application to what we see in our day. And so starting in verse 18... Right? He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So there's a couple things we need to understand. First, he says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Right? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's important to understand that this is, he puts this in the present tense. Right? Often when we think of God's wrath, when we think of God's judgment, we place it as some future eschatological event that's only going to take place at the end of time. But he's saying that it's happening right now, right? When Paul wrote this, he was saying it's being revealed. It is revealed right now. 
that God's wrath, God's judgment against sinners is something that takes place in time. Yes, there will be a future judgment that comes at the end of all time, but there is judgment that is taking place right now. There is judgment taking place right now. There is wrath being revealed in our present day. And he says that, is, that this wrath is being revealed against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So what is he saying here? He's saying that there is a truth that man knows. Right? There's a truth that man has. And in his unrighteousness, right, in his ungodliness, he is suppressing that truth. The best way I've heard to explain this suppression of truth is like trying to hold a ball uh, uh, underwater. Have any of y'all tried to do that? Basketball, you know, uh, soccer ball, one of those, you know, dodge balls. You try to hold it underwater and sometimes you can get a firm grasp on it and it stays underwater, but then all of a sudden the water moves a certain way and it just, it pops right back up to the surface, right? That's what this suppression is like. We, we try our hardest to, to, to suppress the truth of God uh, uh, in our sin, in our unrighteousness, and it, it, it consistently just keeps popping back up. The reality is, is it keeps popping back up because this is this is God's world, and there's no, there's no getting around that. There's no getting around the fact that this is God's world. And so he says that, uh, uh, that we suppress this truth, and what exactly is this truth? And he goes on to explain that in verse uh, 19. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them, them being mankind. What can be known about God is plain to us because God has shown it to us. Right? So it's, what, what, what Paul is trying to lay out is that there is this truth that we are actively suppressing Right? We're actively trying to keep down, and we are working very hard to suppress this truth. And this truth is, is knowledge of God. Right? He says, uh, uh, it, it, uh, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. The reality is, is that everyone, everyone, even the atheist, even the agnostic, even the uh, Muslim, even the Mormon, even the uh, Buddhist, everyone knows God in their heart of hearts. And they know God because God has made it plain to us. We know God because God has shown himself to us. And he goes on to explain this further in verse 20. For his invisible attributes. So he, so he not only says that we have this sort of a, uh, abstract knowledge of God. No, there's a specific knowledge of God that we have. And this is what he lays out in verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and his divine na nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that are, have been made. So, specifically, we not only, it's not just we have this idea of a higher power, right? Because that's kind of, when we say that people know God, that's kind of what we, you know, we automatically think. is like, oh, there's just this sort of abstract, you know, nebulous knowledge of, you know, a, uh, a, a higher being, right? I don't, know, I don't know God, but I know there's a higher being. Uh, not according to the scriptures, the scripture is saying that we know this God. We know the one true and living God. And specifically, we know of his eternal attributes, uh, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature. Right? So we know God. We know God is specifically God, and we know that he is eternal. Right? So this knowledge that we're suppressing is not just this sort of like, well, I kind of believe there's a God, but not really. No, no, we're suppressing an actual uh, specific knowledge of God. Right? His eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Right? So he even lays out further that this knowledge that we have of God is not just, like I said, not just an abstract knowledge, but it's a specific knowledge, and we have this knowledge so much so that there is no excuse for our disbelief. So a lot of people... Um, when they have some issues with religion or they have some issues with God, one of the things that will of, often be uh, thrown at Christians is like, well, what about the tribe in the middle of nowhere that's never heard the gospel before? Scripture tells us that they have sufficient knowledge of God and the things that have been made so much so that there is no excuse for their disbelief. Well, I just can't trust a God that would uh, condemn people who have never heard of him. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says they have heard of him. And they know him so much so that they're without excuse. Right? There is no excuse for their disbelief. And the reality is, is that if you are not in Christ, this is your current state. 
The current state that you are in is a state of disbelief, is a state of wickedness, suppressing the knowledge of God so that if you remain in that state, one day God will be just and righteous for condemning you. That's the reality of man's condition without Christ, is that we have the knowledge of God and there is no excuse for our disbelief. Like I mentioned earlier, we live in God's world and there's no getting around that. We are God's creation and there's no getting around that fact. We know this God and there is no excuse for our disbelief. That is the condition of man. Paul lays it out very clearly. Uh, so, so much so that they are without excuse. And he goes on to, um, to, to continue this. But before that, I want to mention a, a quote by a famous atheist by the name of Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell was a famous uh, atheist who had philosopher. Uh, philosophers are kind of weird if you're into that sort of thing. I know I am. It is weird. But anyways, uh, Bertrand Russell was once asked uh, what he would say or what, what, he would, what he would do if he found himself after death uh, confronted with the God of Scripture. And, uh, and, and he was asked, what would you say if you were faced with God and God asked you, why didn't you believe in me? And what Bertrand Russell said was, I would tell God that there was just not enough evidence. There's not enough evidence. And the reality is Bertrand Russell died in 1970. And the reality is, is that he did stand before God, and that's not what he said. And the scripture lays that out clearly. Bertrand Russell had no excuse. He says there was not enough evidence. Scripture tells us that he had sufficient evidence in the things that have been made, so much so that he was without excuse. And he found that out one day. He found that out one day. And so moving on to verse uh, 21, uh, Paul goes on. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this is important to understand. So he says that for although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. And what that kind of implies in that language is that this knowledge that we have is even more specific. Not only do we know who this God is, but we know that He is worthy of honor and He's worthy of our thanks. And we don't give it to Him. Right? Really, leaving us without excuse even further. Uh, the implications here is that we know who God is and we know that He deserves our praise, He deserves our thanks, He deserves our honor, and we refuse to give it to Him. And instead, we become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So, there's a direct correlation between this rejection against God, the suppression of truth and, un and unrighteousness, and uh, becoming futile in our thinking and our hearts being darkened. One of the things that we see in our culture is that sin uh, just ends up leaning to more sin. That that's the answer that the world has to all the problems, right? Is that uh, how do we deal with this problem over here? Well, we just create a new problem, right? Uh, how do we deal with this problem over here? Well, we just create a new problem. And, 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 and what ends up happening is that our Thinking, if, if we reject God, right, if we reject what God has laid out in his scriptures, if we reject the knowledge that he has given us of his existence, what ends up happening is, is we just keep spiraling down into more and more sin. And as Pastor Tim says all the time, sin makes you stupid. And the reality is that it, it does. The more you sin, the more stupid you get because our thinking just becomes more futile and our, our hearts become more darkened and we just end up getting turned in on ourselves and we have... We, we have no wisdom. We have no knowledge. We have instead rejected the truth, and so all we have left are, is falsehood. All we have left is a lie. And uh, going uh, into verse uh, 22, Paul makes this clear. He says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Right? And this, is, this, to me, is what is on full display in our culture today. If you watch any news station, if you, uh, if you, watch any, uh, if you listen to any podcast, if you watch any uh, commentator, you listen to any politician... They will say some of the stupidest and the most like outrageous things, and it just makes you wonder, like, you, like how do you even think this is actually like viable or true? I'm trying to think of some examples, and there's just too many. I can't point out a specific one, but the reality is, is that if you reject God, and all you have left is the world's wisdom, the world's wisdom is foolish. The world's wisdom is not. It, it is not. It's it's not wisdom. It's idiocy. And they claim, the world will claim to have knowledge of God, but the reality is, is that, or they'll claim to have knowledge to be able to rightly discern current events. 
They'll be able to claim to rightly understand what is taking place in our culture. And the reality is, is they can't because they have rejected the knowledge of God. Uh, they become futile in their thinking and, and claiming to be wise, they become fools. Like I said, anybody who has spent any time in philosophy at all recognizes this. Every philosopher wants to answer the big questions in life. Who are we? Why are we here? What is our purpose? And every single one of them, if they reject God, they come up with some ridiculous and stupid answer. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and if you're perceptive, you, you can see it. You can see their attempt to answer these difficult questions, and their answer just falls flat on its face. <clears throat> they go on this huge diatribe to sort of explain the plight of man and what the solution is to salvation. And what do they end up coming to? They end up coming to, well, there is no solution. We live on a rock of meaninglessness in a world that doesn't care, in a universe that didn't have us in mind. We are just the result of time and chance acting on matter. Life has no purpose. And that's what you're left with. Some wisdom, right? And this is... <clears throat> And this is, this is ultimately what will happen to any individual, any community group, any nation that rejects God. Any attempt, any attempt to operate in God's world apart from God's ways will ultimately end in foolishness. Sometimes it might take a little bit longer to get there. <coughs> Sometimes uh, by common grace, God restrains evil. But the reality is, is that if you continue in rejection of God, you, what you're ultimately left with is foolishness. And uh, one uh, glaring example of this is our current government, right? <coughs> and our government's rejection of God and his word, they continue to oppress uh, its citizens with endless wars, mounting debt that will cripple generations to come, unjust laws such as abortion, theft of its citizens through unjust taxation and economic policy. And now we see just how bad it gets when they force you to stay inside for months on end and give you a measly uh, half day's wage to, to survive. Right? That is what the wisdom of this world gives you. When you reject God, when you reject his word, when you reject his ways, you will ultimately be left with foolishness. Utter foolishness. Paul goes on. Uh, claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. <coughs> the foolishness of this world ultimately leads to the rejection of God and the pursuit of idols. That's what he's laying out here. Uh, sometimes when we read the scriptures, we read things like this and we go, oh, that's not happening in our day, right? We don't have any you know, images of of, of man or birds or creeping things, right? We're not, we're not so primitive like those ancient people where they would actually make statues and worship the statues. But the reality is, is the idolatry is all the same. Sure, it might manifest itself outwardly different than it did before, but the idolatry is the same. The reality is, is that we turn inwards on ourselves and we worship ourselves. We worship the gods of our own making. And this is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Do you all remember the story of Adam and Eve? Right? What was, the serpent's, what was the serpent's temptation? What did he bring to Eve? He said that if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. Right? You'll get to occupy the throne. You'll be the get, get to be the one that determines right from wrong. Truth from falsehood. Wisdom from foolishness. And what did it ultimately lead to? Where we are today. Right? This is what the wisdom of this world gets you. And the reality is, is that throughout the scripture and throughout the history of mankind, this is what we see on full display. Men attempting, men first of all rejecting the knowledge they have of God, suppressing that truth and unrighteousness, and then attempting to be gods themselves. Moving on into verse uh, 24. So Paul lays out this whole um, understanding of what, uh, of, of man's condition. He lays out the fact that we have this knowledge and it's not an obscure knowledge, it's a specific knowledge of God. We not only know who he is, but we know that he is our creator and that he is worthy of honor and glory and praise and thanks, and we refuse to give it to him. 
And what ends up happening is we become uh, foolish. We become foolish. And so verse 24, he says, therefore. Y'all know the, uh, the rule. Anytime you see a therefore, you need to ask what it's there for, right? Usually the therefore is referring to something that came before it. So he's saying, in light of all of these things, in light of the condition of mankind, therefore, God gave them up. In verse 24, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. So what happens, right? What happens when this exchange takes place? So we were created in God's image. We were created to glorify him. We were created to honor him, to praise him, to thank him, to spread his glory, to take dominion over the world and spread his glory throughout all of the earth. And instead, what we've done is we have rejected God, we have attempted to suppress this truth and unrighteousness, and despite the suppression of truth, we are still left without excuse, and we reject wisdom, and we become foolish, and what does God do? It says that God gives us up, God gives us up to the lust of our hearts and to impurity, to the dishonoring of our bodies among ourselves. This is the wrath that is being revealed, right? When Paul, when Paul says at the beginning, he says the wrath of God is being revealed. This is what he's talking about. Right? It's important to understand sin leads to more sin. And do you know what the judgment for sin is? More and deeper sin. Right? And the reality is, is we see this. We see this all the time. Right? When we reject God and we pursue idols, God gives us more of what we want. We say, God, I don't want you. I want my sin. And he says, all right, then have, have some more. Have some more sin. And this is why, this is why you have such things as, you know, gateway drugs, right? This is, uh, the reality is, is there's no drug that needs to allow another drug, but the reality, but the truth is, is that when we pursue idols, when we pursue sin, when we pursue our own pleasure, the only way, the, the only thing that comes from that is more sin. So it starts with, you know, something not so bad, it starts with a little alcohol, then it moves to a little you know, marijuana, and then it moves to some cocaine, and then it moves to heroin, and before you know it, like, we've overdosed, right? That, when we see that happening, what we're seeing is Romans 1 on display. What we're seeing is God giving them up to the lusts of their flesh. What we see is the reality that when we pursue sin, all we get is more sin, and that sin ultimately leads to our destruction. This is why pornography is so dangerous, Right? Because it never stops with just pornography. The next thing you know, you're going to a strip club. The next thing you know, you're actually engaging in, in adultery. The next thing you know, you're actually doing the things you swore you would never do. Oh, no, it's innocent. It's a, it's a victimless crime. It's just pictures. It's just videos. The reality is, is that sin leads to more sin. And when God gives us up, when God reveals his wrath against us and executes his judgment against us in time, what that leads to is just more and greater sin adding to our condemnation on that final day. The reality is, is that when we continue to sin, when we reject God, God gives us up to our sin, to the impurity of our hearts, to dishonorable passions. And the reason that God continues to do this is because we have exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and we've served the creature rather than the creator. This is every man's condition before God. Man and woman, mankind. This is our condition before God, apart from Christ. As we reject God, we reject God, we worship the creature rather than the creator. We exchange the truth of the living God, the only true triune living God of Scripture, and we say, you know what, no, I'd rather be my own God. It's what happened in the garden, it's what continued to happen throughout redemptive history, it's what we see happening today, is this rejection of God. And so Paul goes on again. Uh, starting in verse uh, 26. He says, For this reason, God gave them up a second time to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And so what we see is we see uh, what goes from uh, in verse uh, 20, 24 and 25. Right? He gives us up to the lust of our hearts, to dishonor, uh, dishonoring of our bodies, because we exchange the truth about God for a lie. And then that becomes, uh, uh, that becomes deeper and greater, starting in verse 26. Right? 
So it moves from, the sin moves from the small spaces in our hearts, and then it moves outwards. And now it's starting to affect other people. Now, it's not just, it's not just well, you know, this is, this is what I engage in in the private thoughts in the back of my mind when nobody's looking. Right? When nobody knows, this, this is what's going on in my mind. These are, this is the sin that I'm engaging in, just in my thought space. Not, it's not happening out here. Right? I don't act on it, right? but I still feel this way. But I still think this way. But I still want sin this way. I don't act on it. I'm not doing anything about it, but I want to. And when we continue to reject God, he gives us up that second time. And so it's not only uh, in the small spaces of our hearts, but then it moves outwards, right? For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Sin only leads to more and greater sin. Sin only leads to more deeper sin. And we see this a third time, starting in verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up a third time to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. So now it's not only uh, sin that has you know, occupied the small spaces of our minds. It's now not only sin that is specifically being act- acted on, but now it's affecting our entire being, right? Often, uh, you know, in Christian circles, we'll, we'll speak of individuals struggling with particular sins. And I think that's the reality for most people. We all sort of have our own individual vices. You know, certain things we're prone to as opposed to other things. Um, uh, one uh, kind of uh, you know, famous pastor out in Texas, Matt Chandler, kind of put it this way. He said, if somebody came up to me in the parking lot and offered me black tar heroin, that wouldn't be difficult for me to say no. That's not something I'm prone to. Somebody else, that might be difficult for them to say no. But for me, it wouldn't. And that's the reality. There's certain sins that we're prone to and others that we're not. But the reality is, if we continue in our sin, Right? If we continue to pursue sin, if we continue to suppress the knowledge of God, it's now not just these specific areas that we struggle with. Right? It's not just these specific things. But it starts, uh, uh, God gives us up to a debased mind. It starts to infect everything, every part of our being. And so now this little sin that you know, I like in my thoughts and this little sin that, yeah, I kind of practice you know, on the side just a little bit, it's now affecting everything. Uh, Starting in verse 29, he says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Right? He's he's hitting every every block. They are full of envy, of murder, of strife, of deceit, of maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Inventors of evil, right? Sin is not good enough anymore. We have to invent new ways to sin, right? The, The old conventional ways aren't good enough. We need to come up with some of that newfangled stuff. You know what I'm saying? We need some new sin. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Now, it's not just just a thought experiment. It's not just in a little area over here. It's it's infecting every part of our being to the point where there's nothing we can do except sin. Everything, Everything we touch is sin. Every thought of our hearts is sin. And then in verse 32, he says, Though they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give hearty approval. They give approval to those who practice them. So, to sort of sum up what Paul is saying uh, at, at the end of this chapter, right? So, he speaks about man's condition. He talks about God's response to man's condition, to man's actions, that God continues to give us up. He continues to give us up. He continues to give us up to the point where we are inventing evil. And he says that although we know God's righteous decree and we know that those who practice such things deserve to die, we not only do them, but we give hearty approval to those who do. And I I love the way that Paul puts it in this final verse because this is exactly what we see taking place in our culture, right? We see people who know what is right from wrong. 
And like I say, they suppress the truth, right? They try to say that these sins are okay, but they can't keep the truth down because this is God's world. So they'll say that uh, abortion is not sin, it's not murder, it's okay. But then the truth pops up and they go, but racism is bad. And it's like, well, how do you know racism is bad and abortion's wrong? Or, or abortion, abortion's okay, but racism is, is, is wrong. Right? Like, like how, how can you make that? The reality is, is the only reason they know that is because they live in God's world. The only reason they know that is because they live in God's world. And we continue to see that as they live in God's world. But the truth is, is that they not only pursue their sin, we not only see people um, continuing to engage in sin, but they give hearty approval to those who do engage in sin. Um, one of the, the biggest ways you see this is, is with abortion. Most people... In the media, most people, even in the evangelical church, will try to make the case that abortion is, um, is a difficult choice. It is a choice that is hard for women to make. And I, you know, I, I can understand that and I will agree with that because um, Romans 1 says that they know what the truth is. We know what the truth is, and yet we reject the truth. And that's what, and that's what we see in abortion. But the problem with abortion is not so much... Um, the women who engage in these evil acts, but it's the culture saying, yes, more. This is a good thing. This is a good thing for our society. This is a good thing for women. And the reality is it's not. God's word tells us that it's murder. And yet what do we do? We continue to suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness, and we continue to pursue our sin. Paul reiterates the point that in our heart of hearts, we not only know God's law and we know the penalty for breaking God's law. Every single one of us. So he even hones in even further. This knowledge that we have is not just of God. It's not just of some specific attributes of his. We not only know that he deserves our honor and our thanks and our praise, but we know that to deny God these things deserves death. Despite this, we not only engage in sin and lawlessness, but we give hearty approval to those who do the same. This is what we see taking place in our culture. Sure, there are some outside sort of extenuating uh, circumstances that have helped to exacerbate these problems, but the reality is, is that when you get down to the very bottom, the problem in our culture is not the liberals. The problem in our culture is not the white supremacists. The problem in our culture is not Black Lives Matter. The problem in our culture is sin. The problem in our culture is that we have rejected God. We've rejected God as individuals. We've rejected God as community groups. We have rejected God as a nation. And what we are seeing on full display is that rejection of God leading to foolishness and ultimately leading to our judgment. That's why the the sin continues and it grows. It's not only just in these small areas, it's, it's it's in everything. It's because sin leads to more and greater sin. And when God reveals his wrath and his judgment against sin, in time, what we're left with is more sin and greater sin. And so what are we supposed to do about it? What are we supposed to do about the condition of man? What are we supposed to do about what we see in our culture? This is, this is difficult. This is a hard truth to grasp. And this is a hard truth to accept. The culture wants to tell you that man is basically good. That uh, what man just needs is the right set of circumstances. And he'll thrive. But that's not what God's word tells us. God's word tells us that we are actively engaging in the suppression of truth. Specific truths. We are in open rebellion against him. Against his decrees. Against his laws. Against his ways. And that as judgment for our sins, what we get is more and greater sin. And that if we continue in our sins, when we reach that final judgment day, we will be rightly condemned to hell for the sins that we've committed. We have no excuse. We have no excuse for our disbelief. That is man's condition. That's where we are. And if you're not in Christ, that's where you are today, right now. And so what are we supposed to do about it? How are we supposed to answer these problems? How are we supposed to deal 
with these things. The world in all its foolishness will offer solutions, right? They'll say, vote Democrat. They'll say, vote for Trump. Drain the swamp. Maybe if we just had free college. Maybe if we had easier access to abortion. Maybe if we get the right judges on the Supreme Court. Maybe, maybe if we just burn the whole thing down, right? Maybe we should all just get our guns and just, and just go burn the whole thing down. All of this, however good it may sound, at its foundation is utter foolishness apart from Christ. The reality is, is that the only answer to what plagues our nation, the only answer to what plagues our culture, the only answer to what plagues our world is the gospel. And I know that sounds quaint and pithy and like, well, yeah, the gospel is the answer. And sometimes when people offer that as a solution, it is just that. It's a quaint little pithy answer to sort of get around having to answer any hard questions. Well, if we just preach the gospel to them. It's like, well, yes, but it needs to be a little more fleshed out than that. And so what do I mean? What do I mean the gospel is the answer? Because we literally have cities on fire. We literally have cities on fire today. A million babies a year are murdered in their mother's wombs. Over 60 million babies in the last, in the last half century. 60 million. That's more than any, any genocide that's taken place in history. That's more than the Holocaust. More babies. It's safer. It is much safer. It would have been safer to be a Jew in World War II than to be a baby in modern day America. 60 million babies. What do we do? What do we do with all this sin on full display, all this rejection of God on full display? How do we answer this problem? And the answer is, is that the only way we deal with this is through the gospel. The gospel that is laid out in the scriptures. The truth is, is that the only way, the only way that we deal with sin is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2, Paul makes a, an excellent sort of summary statement of the gospel. Like I've said, Romans is sort of his systematic breakdown of what the gospel is and how to understand it. But he does make some great, um, he does make some great statements in his other letters. And I want to read this for you in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And he says, And though you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, Right? The course of this world is the rejection of God, the suppression of truth. Following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. All of us. There is none of us that can claim any sort of superiority when it comes to our sinful condition. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's our condition. That's what Paul spells out for us in Romans 1. But starting in verse 4, he says, But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he had, uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up with him, and seated, uh, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he may sh might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing; it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he, which God has prepared before him, that we should walk in them. The gospel is the answer. The gospel is the answer. This is, Romans 1, that is not just the condition of what we see out there. That was my condition. Every Christian who has ever lived, that is their condition before God. Objects of wrath. Suppressing the truth of God and unrighteousness. Carrying out the desires of the flesh. Being given up to sin and more sin and greater sin. But God. But God, in his mercy, in the richness of his love and grace, has saved us. And the reality is, is if we want to see change in our culture, it is that gospel that will save. 
The only reason I can look out there in the world and say this is wrong, the only reason I can say that and I can reject the foolishness of this world is because God has given me a new heart. And that's the reality for every Christian is that God has given us a new heart. But we cannot expect people to act like Christians when they have dead hearts. He says it here. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins, among whom we all lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Our condition before God in our natural state is dead. It is to choose sin. It is to choose more and greater sin. We don't want the things of God, but God, in His mercy, has made us alive in Jesus Christ. And if we want to see people change out there, first what we need to do is we need to preach that gospel to ourselves continually. We need to continue to consult God's Word we need to continue to see his gospel in the scriptures and to allow it to transform us. And then we need to take that to our neighbors, to our friends at school, our virtual school nowadays. <laughs> Often we want so bad for the things out there to be changed, for the things out there to be better. And yet we reject, the, we reject this gospel. We reject taking this gospel to our family members, to our next-door neighbors, to our best friends, to the people we talk to on Twitter or on Facebook or wherever kids are talking these days. I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not hip with this stuff anymore. If we want to see true and lasting change, what we don't need is dead people to stop acting like dead people. What we need is for people to be made alive. And the only way they're made alive is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in closing, I just want to say that if you are apart from Christ, if you do not know Jesus Christ in a saving relationship, because Romans 1 tells us, Romans 1 tells us that we have sufficient knowledge of God so much so that we are without excuse. We know who this God is and yet we reject Him. And if that is your condition today, if you are apart from Christ... I implore you, with everything that is in me, to come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. And I can promise you this, that everyone who comes to Christ in repentance and faith will find Him to be a sufficient and perfect Savior. It is only through Him that we can have true wisdom. It is only through Him that we have the truth. He is the only way to the Father, and He is the only life worth living. And so, hopefully, these words have, have pierced your heart today. And the reality is, is that if you're concerned, if you're thinking that perhaps I am apart from Christ, we want to talk to you. Talk to your friends. Talk, talk to the adults here. There are several people who want to walk with you, who want to lead you to the truth of Jesus Christ. And like I said, He is a sufficient and a perfect Savior. Jesus says, of all that the Father gives me, I will lose none of them. None of them. And so there is no fear. There is no fear of being left behind by Jesus Christ. If you look to Him for salvation, if you put your faith and trust in Him and in Him alone, you will find Him to be a perfect Savior. And on that last day, rather than being clothed in our sin and our, right, and our unrighteousness and our evil, we will be clothed in His righteousness because He's paid the penalty for our sins. Because he wore our sin, because he bore our unrighteousness and took upon himself the wrath of God that was intended for us in our sinful state, we can now be clothed in his righteousness. That is the hope of the gospel, and that is the only hope for our world today. I'm going to pray for us, and then the band's going to come up and sing, and then um, we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, as we look at what is taking place in our culture, Lord, as we look at the things around us, the madness, the chaos, the sin, the, the, the unrighteousness, Lord, the foolishness, Lord, we are often tempted to look to other saviors, to look elsewhere for salvation. We're often tempted to answer the questions of life with the wisdom of this world.
But God, we've seen through your word that the wisdom of this world is foolishness. God, that in continuing to pursue our sin only leads to greater and more sin, deeper sin. And so, Lord, I pray that the truth of your gospel would be alive in us, God, and that we would take the truth of that gospel to a lost and a dying world. Jesus is king. This is your world. God, and I pray, God, I pray that the gospel truth would come to everyone within the sound of my voice, Lord, that they would bow their knee in submission to this great king. God, that you would give them new hearts and cause them to follow after you. It is only through this gospel that we will see lasting and true change in this world. Lord, I pray for these students here. God, I pray if there are those who do not know you, Lord, God, I pray that their conscience would be pricked. God, I pray that your spirit would begin to move in their hearts. Lord, that they would begin to recognize the foolishness of this world, the folly of their sin. God, and they would begin to see the beauty in the gospel of your son, the gospel of his kingdom. Lord, we pray all these things in your precious and in your holy name. Amen.